In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Marianne's guests are leaders in their field, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in their own work. They teach others to develop, refocus, and grow. Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. And remember, make every moment count. Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so excited to be introducing our very special guest, Dr. Judith Orloff, and she's here today to talk to us about her new book, The Impasse Survival Guide. So welcome to the show, Dr. Judith. Thank you. I'm happy to be on. Oh, what a joy it is to have you here, and what a fabulous book. I absolutely love this, <laughs> you know. So it's, uh, it's filled with just lots of tips and tools, and so why don't we start at the beginning, because there may be some people who are listening that might be a little bit new to empaths and, and what that means. So what is an empath? Well, I'm a psychiatrist in Los Angeles, and I'm also an empath. And what that means is that I combine my traditional medical skills with my ability to sense and feel into people through an intuitive form of empathy. And that lets me feel what's going on in my patients and know and understand them, mind, body, and soul. But the reason I wrote the Empath Survival Guide was that although empaths have many positive points, such as intuition, compassion, depth, connection, you know, all kinds of things, they have challenges because they are emotional sponges that absorb other people's emotions, physical symptoms, and angst into their own bodies, and they often become exhausted or depressed or anxious unless they have the tools that I present in the book, which can allow them to be an empowered empath without, you know, absorbing too much from the world and being brought down by it. And that's such an important thing. You know, I wish there was a book, a book like yours when I first started my spiritual journey because it was, you know, being an empath can be like a trial by fire because it's really tough to go out in public and you get bombarded by the sound and the noise and just other people's emotions. And I thought your book really was just amazing on how it gave these great tools for people to use to go ahead and, um, you know, not be a hermit, to still be able to live, you know? Yeah, exactly, because, you know, some of my empath patients who come to me, you know, are hermits and shut-ins and agoraphobics because, you know, it's just gone on too long, the empathy overload and sensory overload without strategies, so they just retreat from the world. And at this point in our world, we need our empaths. We need our empaths to come out of the closet and own their abilities because, you know, I believe that empaths and people with empathy and love will save the world. So, you know, I wanted to write this book so people have the strength to deal with the downside and rise up into their power using the strategies that I present day after day, because these are strategies I use as an empath on my book tour, because it's, it's hard for me to be in airports. Um, and, and it's a challenge to be around hundreds of people every day in my events. And so I need to learn how to center myself and not absorb the, the chaos and angst around me. Well, and especially in today's very in today's world, there's so much that we're being bombarded with. It seems to it seems to even be a little bit more than it was like ten years ago, when um, you know, at least as an empath myself, as I like when I would go out, I could just you could just feel it. <laughs> yeah, it's thick in the air. It's yeah, you know, last six months. The stress level and uncertainty and chaos in the world has gone up so much that even people who weren't empaths before are becoming empaths because the stress is stripping away their normal defenses. And so now they're becoming newly sensitive to all of this and in need of strategies. Well, that's, um, I found that your book was perfect for people at every level. Um, especially because if you have, you know, a small child at home who's an empath, how do you empower that child? Or if you're, you know, every day in the workplace, you know, we, we've got to go to work and we've got to do our thing. 
how do you protect yourself in the workplace? And your book had all these inspirational tools that were, I, I mean, I've used quite a few of them reading through it, and they're really effective. Yeah, well, they've had to be because I've had to develop them for myself. Mm-hmm. And if I don't practice the tools in the book, I won't be good for anybody. You know, if I'm not centered and I'm not clear and I can't set, you know, really fierce boundaries with my time and with the people I'm around and the amount of time I work versus alone time, you know, I, I wouldn't be right. But if, if I can really stick to my regimen of all of that, I am, you know, fantastic. I am, you know, when, when you're an empath in balance, you are enjoying life, you know, so much and it's so deep and so mysterious and so full of love and connection because as an empath, connection is really important to me. And I don't like to be around lots of people, you know, in terms of my own personal life, but I like my intimate connections, one-to-one or small groups. And that's very typical of empaths is they don't like to go to big events like big sporting events or big concerts with tons of people there because then you absorb all the energy from the crowd and it can be overwhelming but an empath who is balanced is so joyous and so intuitive and so connected it's just an amazing experience as a human being what what are some of your favorite self-care tips that empaths can use on a daily basis well, one, a must, is that I must have adequate alone time during each day. And if I don't have my alone time to meditate, um, then I'll be thrown off because empaths tend to replenish themselves when they're alone mm-hmm. uh, versus other people, extroverts, who will go out to a party to replenish themselves. An empath would never do that. You know, an empath always wants to go home and go in the bathtub. I, I use water to wash away and cleanse the negative energy that clings to me. Mm-hmm. So I, I need to take a bath every night. Um, I meditate at my altar to connect to myself and connect to spirit. I walk by the ocean because the water is my element and I really get fed by it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I And I set very clear boundaries in my life. And I know that's hard. For empaths, because empaths are healers and givers and people pleasers and want to fix other people. And so part of the strategies in the Empath Survival Guide is realizing on the deepest of deep levels that you can't fix anybody. Mm -hmm. And not only that, it's none of your business to try to take away someone else's pain, you see. And then when you realize that and really reprogram your, your brain, that stops a lot of the absorption you'll feel when people are going through pain and suffering. Yeah, and I I love how you put that too because a lot of times in past do you feel like, oh, there's a problem here, I've got to fix it. And right. you know, and then there's that appropriate boundary that you that you talk about where it's like, you know, they're going through their journey and you know, that's that's part of what they're here to do. So well Absolutely. You, mm-hmm. And I know in your book, you talk about, and I was really intrigued by this, emotional hangovers. So what is an emotional hangover and how can empaths protect themselves from that? Yes, empaths often feel emotional hangovers. It's like an alcohol hangover, but instead it's the energetic residue of an interaction that just stays lingering in your energy field. So you feel it like a cloud around you. You still feel the yucky feeling of whatever went on you know, in the interaction or just the overwhelm. Maybe you just had too much going on in the day and so you have an emotional hangover. And so the key is to keep breathing it out. Don't hold your breath because a lot of times people, when they're afraid or exhausted, hold their breath. And that's the worst thing you could do. That keeps the the negative energy inside of you. So if you breathe it out, if you get into water, if you meditate, um, a visualization I love is picturing my body as a big open window and letting the wind blow through it, just blowing everything that has clung to me during the day out, where I don't do anything but visualize that, and I can feel the air element just rushing through me, and it's a quick and easy visualization, and it really works if you try it. If everyone just you know tries it right now and picture yourself as an open window, Let the breeze blow through everything that is stuck to you, the arguments, the traffic, the travel, you know, the frustrations. Just let them all blow out. 
then you suddenly feel like a transparent, empty space again, or clear space, and it's beautiful. Mm, that is. I got to tell you, your energy is just amazing and off the charts. I just love it. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> and it's, I, it's not surprising that your book carries the same energy. Because, you know, just reading the book it's, and, and especially listening to you go through that practice, you could just really feel this, like, wave of relaxation, this relaxing energy come over. And, and I found the same thing when reading your book. You could feel it kind of takes, kind of takes you down a few octaves to a, a more relaxing state. It was, re- it was really nice. Well, I so. put a lot of love into the book. Oh, you can tell. You can feel it. You can really feel it. Yeah. So. Well, and so I know a lot of times, especially if someone's new as an empath, you know, they have a hard time seeing uh, seeing it as a positive thing. Like we talked at the beginning of the show, what are some ways that they can embrace their gifts? Well, number one, identify the qualities of being an empath. And in the beginning of the book, there's a quiz, self assessment, if you're not sure. And some of the questions include, have I been labeled as overly sensitive all my life? Usually a put down. Um, Do I feel like I don't fit in? Empaths often feel like they don't belong. Do crowds drain me? And do I need alone time to revive myself? That's an important self-care practice. Do noise, smells, or nonstop talkers overwhelm me? You know, empaths have very sensitive smell, and they're noise sensitive. I'm extremely noise sensitive. And so, you know, I, I can't listen to the, the uh, openings of movies, the previews, because they're just too loud in most of the theaters. It's painful for me. And so I either wear earplugs or just don't sit there. Um, do I have chemical sensitivities or a low tolerance to scratchy clothes? Um, empaths often can smell things and are chemically sensitive, and they need to honor that. And do I prefer taking my own car places so that I can leave when I please? Now, that's important because Mm -hmm. empaths like to escape. And, you know, for instance, as an empath, I only stay about two hours in any social situation unless it's unusual because I feel filled then. I'm complete. And anything more, any more talking, interaction, food, music, anything would go over my top stimulation level. And I... You know, I don't want that. Then it's uncomfortable for me. So all my friends know I leave at two, around two hours and don't take it personally. But as an empath, you need to clarify that with your friends and explain yourself to them. It's very important so they don't feel like you're rejecting them. I love how you set these boundaries with it in such a loving way, you know, to have these boundaries set as an empath. And it's okay to do that. You know, a lot it's of people- more than okay. So many of my patients, they just want to people please. And empaths just want you to be happy. They want to people please. They want to listen. You know, they're such good listeners, but they over listen and then they become exhausted. So self care for an empath is to lovingly set boundaries. You can say no in a very loving way. Mm-hmm. You don't have to say no, like stay away from me or draining me. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to offend everybody. <laughs> well, no, it will just make yeah. them feel like they did something wrong. And you have to define what your goal is. You know, my goal is to have a loving circle of friends who understand me and realize it's not personal. But I'll be fierce. Like, I, I've been known to leave, you know, dinners if I'm uncomfortable with the energy. I was at a dinner, I don't know, it was maybe a year ago. And the couple starts arguing and dumping anger on each other. And I wasn't going to get involved with it. And so I just excused myself and said I was tired because I didn't want all that negative energy deposited on me because anger, empaths have a difficult time hearing yelling. It feels like, you know, bullets going through my system. It's just horrible. It's a toxic shower of pain for me to hear anger. And so, you know, in the book, I go through the difference between dumping and venting. Venting is healthy It's when you make a request to talk about an issue. You don't just start up and dump. So that's really important for your loved ones, you know, if you're an empath, to know that about you. And and you see, the great thing is you need to have these kinds of conversations with people. And I specify the different conversations you need to have, you know, in the book. But the way you do it is very loving, very matter-of-fact, and very short. You don't get into long, drawn-out explanations. 
but you do express your need, your authentic needs to your spouse, to your friends, to your loved ones, and you know, hopefully they'll understand. And if not, then you have to set more boundaries. Well, and so that brings me to my next question, um, which is kind of appropriately um, placed: is you talk about um, energy vampires in your book and and protection. So what is, you know, for someone that's kind of starting off on their path and they've picked up your book because they're feeling everything that's going on around us, what is an energy vampire? And what are some of your favorite ways of using protection as well? An energy vampire is somebody who sucks your energy dry. So when you're around somebody, you suddenly feel like your eyelids get heavy, you feel like taking a nap. Uh, you start feeling toxic, sick, anxious, depressed, leaden. But you, you number one, empaths have to notice the changes, you know, in their mood or their energy level when they're talking to someone and, and ask the critical question, is it them or is it me? Mm-hmm. You know, rather than just assuming it's you because empaths always assume it's them, you know, themselves and take the blame for it, like there's something wrong with them. And that is not what's happening. What's happening is empaths are absorbing the energy of other people and is affecting them. So a quick way to know if it's you or them is to move 20 feet away and see if the feelings dissipate. Because if you're standing very close to somebody's energy field, you'll feel more intensely what they're transmitting. And so that's a good experiment for empaths to try, you know, just to to know if it's you or them. And then in the book, I go through different types of energy vampires, which need different techniques. You know, the easier ones would be, let's say, um, the drama queen. You don't Mm -hmm. ever ask a drama queen what he or she is is feeling or doing. You just don't. And if they start up with their drama, you don't ask them more questions about it. You don't look them deeply into the eye as if you're interested. You use I'm not interested body language and kind of cross your legs, look the other way and say, I'm so sorry this is happening to you and I send you all good thoughts, but I've got to get back to my work because drama queens often attack at work. And so, you know, again, it's the loving but firm. Mm-hmm. And then with a chronic talker, empaths have to learn to interrupt which is really hard for them. You know, if somebody corners me, it's the bane of my existence, these people, the chronic talkers. <laughs> really, really drains me if I let it go on. And empaths wear an invisible sign saying, I can help you. Because they're giving and they're good listeners and loving. So just know that. But in a, if a chronic talker corners me, I'll say, you know, I'm so sorry I have to interrupt, but I have to go to the bathroom or I have to go and talk to somebody else now. You know, but I say it matter-of-factly, so they don't even know what happens. And then if they start talking, you say, you know, I'm still so sorry, i got to go. That's it, in and out. That's what I want to emphasize. It's a quick boundary. It's just in and out. It's not, oh, I'm so sorry, or long apologies. It's mm-hmm. in and out. Well, and then that way it gives you the opportunity to make that switch because I've known people that, you know, they can talk for two hours straight and not come up for air, and it is exhausting. Oh, it's horrible. And you have to practice these techniques beforehand. Like with my patients in my private practice in Los Angeles, I'll be the energy vampire and they'll be the empath trying to set boundaries. So, you know, we'll have kind of a psychodrama going on where we can act it out so they can get used to doing it. Otherwise, it's kind of hard. It's hard to get out of their mouth, you know, when it's happening. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I get that. And especially when you first start off, you want to do it with assertion, not aggression, you know, and, and it can sometimes get a little mixed up there when you start. <laughs> right. Or you start apologizing for yourself, which is mm-hmm. not what you want to do. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just empowered, firm, short, in and out. And then the most dangerous kind of, of energy vampires I talk about in the book are the narcissists, of course. These people are me, 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 me. Everything's about them, except in the beginning, where it seems like everything's about you. And they're loving, and they could be charming and smart, and seeming to have empathy, but they don't. Then they reel you in, but when you don't do what they want, they become cold, withholding, and punishing. And so the short version of this is that empaths need to know that narcissists have what's called an empathy-deficient disorder. Mm -hmm. 
they are not capable of feeling empathy as you know it. So you can't cure them with your compassion, and they're never going to be really interested in your feelings. And this is so hard for a lot of my empath patients to get because when narcissists turn it on in the beginning, they seem so amazing. But the way to test that out is just provoke a conflict in the beginning. Do something that's not according to what they want, and usually that brings out their colors. I love how you put that too, because it's you know it is tough for people to see that narcissistic tendency sometimes, and to not take it personally. You know, it's like, well, that's yeah. the way that they're doing things, and I'm going to set my boundaries. I mean, and I've got my impact uh, survival guide here, so I'm, I'm good to go. <laughs> go to page eighty-seven, look up narcissists, and go, aha! I uh-huh. like fun. This is what I do. <laughs> Well, you know, Dr. Judith, um, I know that you've got a lot of great events coming up. Um, People can go to your website at drjudithorloff.com and they can see all the events that you have. I'm going to be attending one of them coming up here um, soon. Um, And we want them to be part of your community. Of course, pick up the Empath Survival Guide. You know, so I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Oh, you're so welcome. And I look forward to meeting you in person in Denver. Oh, I can't wait. (laughs) Well, and uh, we're going to pause here for a quick break, and we'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. Our next guest is here today to talk to us about the power of sharing your story. Kyle McMahon is a recording artist with Warner, and while many of you know Kyle for his musical talents, it was his guest appearance on Oprah Life Class that has a lot of people talking. So Kyle had the courage to share his story about being fatherless and how that pain haunted him. It was through that surprise appearance and three other appearances since then on Oprah's Life Class that healing was able to take place for Kyle, and now he's here to inspire others about the power of telling your story. So welcome to the show, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Marianne. Hey, what a joy it is to have you here. So I know you're here today to talk to us about the power of telling your story. How did you come across this kind of a message to bring forth? Well, I appeared on a series of Oprah's Life Class shows uh, subtitled Fatherless Son. And what that really did for me was made me realize how powerful it is to tell your story. And I went on there and uh, told a story that I really hadn't told many people up to that point. And then I went on national television and ended up uh, kind of bearing my soul. And what I realized was that these people, complete strangers who had watched the live show or the broadcast or whatever um, on YouTube later were reaching out to me and telling me how this had changed their lives in a way, Um, whether it was uh, reconnecting. My story was in regards to my father. So whether it was reconnecting with their father or their son or letting go what happened. um, And I realized, wow, this is so unbelievably powerful that someone can go and just be honest and be 100% real and bear their soul to the world. And it can really change lives. Well, I I think when people get that, 
that um, dark monster from outside the closet and have the you know the courage like you did to share your story, then it really allows other people to come forth and develop some type of healing around that whole that um, whole event or that whole story that they have going on. Absolutely, you know I didn't plan on crying on Oprah, <laughs> but um, but I did. She, she you know that that. Can happen sometimes. She has and a way I'll of doing you, that. <laughs> she really, really, really does. And yeah. you know, it it is amazing just how far-reaching it has been for me in ways that I never even imagined. Yeah. Well, and I think again, I mean, I applaud you for having that courage and being so vulnerable because people can look at that and go, gosh, I can really relate to this story because I have the same thing going on. I went through something similar. You know, so what were some of the things during this whole this whole time that that kind of surprised you in regards to telling your story? Well, I was surprised at the amount of people that bared their soul back to me. I really was. Um, I to this day I get emailed. I mean, I've got thousands of messages, Facebook, email, Twitter, um, ev- everywhere you could think of, Google Plus, and people just bearing their soul back to me. And that has been so surprising because I didn't realize um, how powerful my story, how powerful telling my story could be. So that was definitely a shock to me. You know, to be 100% honest, I did the show for me. Mm -hmm. Um, But what ended up happening was I saw that it could help other people. So I haven't stopped telling that story since. (laughs) Well, I know you've gone through this whole process of rebranding your website. So it's more inclusive of people being able to connect and also um, feel like they can be part of telling their story as well. Absolutely. I I, I completely rebranded my website to be less about me, which it was before, and more about people and I, you know, it, I thought, hey, if my story can can help change somebody's life, then everybody else that has a story to tell might be able to do the same thing. And if I can give my little voice in the world to help people tell their story and get it out there to maybe help somebody else, then that's exactly what was supposed to happen for me. So... Um... So people that have been following you and know your story and, you know, just how you went through and you were sharing all that, what are some of the tips you can share with our audience on how they can start being more open and sharing their story? And where where would it be appropriate to do that and maybe um, have that safe space for them to, to share that? Well, one, on not to plug my own website, but on my website, kyle2u.com, uh, I, I invite people to come to come and tell their story, whether it's through video or through a blog post, whatever it is that uh, they feel most comfortable with. But besides that, whether it's their own vlog on YouTube, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a blogger journal, um, however they most feel comfortable and I do want to point out that it's not always going to feel comfortable, um, but (laughs) to get into the most comfortable place that you can, because there is a, there is such a almost spiritual level of, um, of realization when you start telling your story and letting that go. So, uh, so wherever you can, even if you start with a friend, you know, for a somebody close to you that you trust and love that you feel safe with and can share that vulnerability with. And that's really, really what it comes down to is feeling safe in a vulnerable moment. I think it also opens the door for um, compassion for other people and also for forgiveness to start to take place. Because when we really look at, you know, if we go back through somebody else's story, everyone has a story. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. So like, what's their story? What's brought them to this point that they maybe lash out a certain way or, you know, or, or closed or whatever the case may be. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's amazing the amount of 
uh, variation in the stories that I've received for the website. Um, I, I had somebody who came to me for to, to talk about being transgender, and that was something that I wasn't very familiar with, and it opened my eyes to a lot of things. And that person felt safe um, with me, which I, I am honored. Uh, and we did a video on it, and he um, answered all of my questions, no matter how unintentionally ignorant they were, um, just because I didn't know, but I wanted to know. And I wanted to understand, and, and uh, he, he felt that uh, education was the way to do that. And so he educated myself and uh, a buddy of mine that appeared on the show as well. And, and the audience. I mean, we got, we periscoped it live and we got so many questions. And I was a little bit hesitant because this person had just come out as, as transgender. And I didn't want them to be in a space where their safety um, or even feeling of safety was compromised. But everybody was so awesome in the questions they asked and in the, the vulnerable places that they put themselves in in order to ask him about his story. So uh, it, it, it's truly, truly life-changing. Well, and, you know, I, I, th- I think that's such an honorable thing to have somebody that feels so comfortable with you to be able to come and share that because, you know, for people who don't live in the transgender world, I mean, there are a lot of questions in regards to, you know, you know, just everything. And, and we, you know, most people would probably feel the same way that you did <laughs> it's, as far as the interactions, like, you know, what do you ask? It, you know, this might not, this might be just simple to them, but it's, Something that, um, regardless what the topic is, just something that you know we just need more information on. Absolutely, and you know, and what I've been learning is that the way to change hearts and minds is through the power of telling our own story. Mm-hmm. So, where do things go from here? Because I know you are just a guy that's kind of a mover and a shaker, and I, I can, <laughs> I mean, they, they probably have to, you know, put GPS on you to catch up with all the things that you do. So, where do you see, <laughs> like, you're just everything going from here? So, I'm recording. We did some test shows for um, a YouTube channel called Kyle to You, which was really fun and exciting, but we were um, kind of you know, working out the kink. So we're in the process of recording more of those, uh, where we have people tell their stories. Some of them happen to be, um, more well-known people. Um, and others are everyday people like myself. And, uh, so that's, that's one avenue I've been working on. I've been working on, uh, an ebook, uh, which I'm really excited to finish, uh, about living your dreams. And we do a podcast, an, an extended version of the, the live stream and Kyle to you show um, that is kind of the unedited version, if you will. And then, of course, the website, um, which which has been growing leaps and bounds. I'm really, really happy with how that's turning out. I'm going to eventually need some help to, to keep running that. So, <laughs> Well, if you're doing a shout out for people to get in touch with you in regards to help, that that might have just happened. So we'll see. Yeah, if, yeah. <laughs> we'll see if the right person comes up. It always works out that way, doesn't it? So, yes, um, it does. and um, I know we just have a couple, a couple, like, gosh, a minute here. So where can our listeners, again, find your website? I know you're on Twitter because that's where you and I connected. I've been following all of your great stuff and how we became acquainted. So where okay. can they, yeah, yeah. I, I love your message and your messaging. So keep up the good work on that. So where can other people find you? So I am available at uh, kylemcmahon.me. Hey, you know, kudos for you for all the work you're doing. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today here, Kyle. Thank you, Marianne. I really appreciate you having me. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We're going to pause here for a quick break. If you'd like to learn more about the show, please visit momentswithmarianne.com. And we'll be right back after these messages. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. 
For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com Ben Wexler is a gifted leadership development and strategy consultant for professionals who want to transform their organizations and careers. Through a uniquely personalized set of processes, participants discover their unique knowledge, how to leverage that knowledge and experience, and then put it all together with a global strategy. You're more valuable, your organization is more valuable, and the change is viral. Contact Ben at 630-881-1074. Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so excited to be introducing our next guest, Eden Collingsworth, and she's here today to talk to us about her new book, Behaving Badly, the New Morality in Politics, Sex, and Business. So welcome to the show, Eden. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be on. What a joy it is to have you here, and what a fascinating book. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, certainly a, a timely one. It was, you know, I, I, actually it was scheduled for uh, to be published in the fall, and and the publisher, um, for all the obvious reasons, moved mm-hmm. it forward by five months. So it's been a, you know, it's it's a, a, a book that I think that the the subject of which is of great interest to people now. Oh yes, <laughs> without a doubt. <laughs> you know, and it's easy to see why Newsweek and other great media sources have been picking up your book and having you know these great discussions and highlighting mm-hmm. your book because it it really is touching on a lot of what we're um, what people are kind of it's it's kind of people are feeling tense about it. It's like morality, yeah. you know, like yeah. oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, I mean, the question is, is there, has it changed? Is it on a downward slope? You know, it, it, has it, you know, what has happened to it? What will it be? And so I appreciate the fact that it's, you know, it's a very bewildering time for a great many people. And, and that's, you know, I was one of them. I, I, I can't claim to have actually found any answers, but I, I decided to explore this on my own. And so I'm hoping I bring the reader along with me. Oh, it, it's very well written, a fabulous book. And, you know, yeah. I, I I really enjoyed it. I really did. And oh, I, thank you. <laughs> well, most definitely. And I have to um, ask you, I, I understand the inspiration for your book came, you know, basically it originated um, out of your time that you spent in China. Yes. Um, what what exactly brought you to the idea of writing behaving badly? Well, you're you're absolutely correct. I uh, may have had a rather unconventional career and background, and so um, I was a book publisher at one point. I started a magazine in Los Angeles. I then became a corporate executive um, in New York, um, and I um, was recruited to become the chief of staff of a global think tank, um, which was, you know, based me in Brussels, and I did a fair amount of work in China and Moscow. But the point is that for the last thirty years. Uh, you know, in all of these capacities, I've gone in and out of China. And so I left the, the think tank um, uh, several years ago because I thought uh, um, to move to China, and uh, which was wildly ambitious because I don't speak the language, and to write a book for Chinese um, on Western etiquette or behavior. And th- at the point of giving you all of this information is that even though I had been in and out of China for the better part of 30 years, I would never lived among the Chinese. And I did so for that year. It took me to write the book and work with a Chinese publisher in order to, to, to get it published. And what it, what became very apparent to me is that um, I was operating from, you know, a very strict sense of right and wrong or what is fair. I had, you know, I suppose what one could call a kind of Judeo-Christian sense of of right and wrong. And and the, 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 the people with whom I was living, and keep in mind, you know, the population of China is an equivalent to one in five people on the planet. Um, it's It was very apparent to me that 
theirs was a far more, you know, relative version of China. And it's because they operate with a Confucian, um, you know, platform and, and a philosophy rather than a religion. And they don't believe that there is any one way of that is right. Or, and there are very few ways of being wrong. And, and so there, you know, it was like, frankly, dealing with fog at times. It was, it was, you know, it was what we call in the West moral relativism. And so as a result of having that experience, I started to think about how, whether my own moral values were um, less and less relevant in my own country, because things had become, you know, the, the borders between uh, acceptable behavior and and uh, behavior that that uh, you know would would not have been acceptable as recently as five years ago. That border has become very porous, and you see it everywhere with our politicians, from whom we have less and less respect, but are more and more willing to accept how they behave. You know, in business, where it's it's now extremely difficult sometimes to even define cheating. Um, uh, you know, with our popular culture, you know, in every sense of the word, uh, things are simply more, um, I suppose, the gracious way of putting it, flexible. But mm -hmm. it's confusing to people because, you know, never in the history of the world have we been so interconnected. And so there's an assumption that because of that, you know, we share our values with others. And, and what you which you realize, of course, most especially in the last year, whether it's, you know, Brexit or the Donald Trump um, election, is that sometimes we don't even, uh, you know, we, we're so polarized, we don't even understand the values of the people in our own country. And th I think that's a great surprise. It's very disconcerting. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people have been surprised by a lot of the things going on. Mm. Now, I know in your book you you interviewed a convicted murderer on, regarding morality. What yes. was some of the interesting things you discovered from that conversation? Well, that was my most difficult and compelling, you know, interview and and chapter to write because I along with a great many other people, couldn't imagine um, how this man did what he did. Mm -hmm. And he killed not one but two people. And I had assumed that it was a, it was a, you know, a, a murder of, of, of passion, that he must have come home and found his wife or partner in bed with a love. You know, I mean, I had, you know, I had my own prejudice because he was articulate in the manner in which he communicated with me. We had an email exchange before I met him. And it turned out that, in fact, they were separate murders. They were very gruesome, and they were for no other purpose than to rob. This, his story is something you couldn't possibly make up in fiction because there there is nothing that justifies the hideous crimes, the merciless crimes he committed. Um, that said, he was a he had a hopeless childhood where he ran off. He was his mother was killed. His father was an extremely violent drunk who beat him. He ran off when he was eight and he ran away and he started to steal. And so he graduated to, you know, burglarizing apartments and he, these two people were murdered separately. But the, 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 the I guess, guess that the point of the story is that at no point was he pinned to those murders. In other words, he was not even identified as responsible for murdering those two people. He fled the country and, and, and to, for France. This is some, this happened in the UK. And he joined the Foreign Legion, where, in fact, you can kind of disappear into the ranks. And during the course of the four or five years he was in the Foreign Legion, for the first time ever, he was held responsible. He had a schedule. He it was very disciplined. He was loyal to his, you know, his, uh, you know, the, the people who, who were in his uh, unit. And his point to me was that that was the period of time for the first time in his life that he started to, um, he started to develop scruples, which then allowed him to have a moral you know, a moral understanding of what he had done. And and in a way that's kind of, frankly, unbelievable, he gave himself up. And he, he was, you know, then sent back to the UK. He held, you know, he, he was tried and convicted and was given a 23-year prison sentence, the first year of which was in solitary confinement. And, and, and I, I suppose the 
the what I realized was that that there could be many truths to one person's life. And one truth was that he had done this, you know, this immoral, you know, twice hideous crime. But there was also another truth that somehow he managed to become a moral agent by first giving himself up and uh, realizing that he was he didn't have to, you know, he could have disappeared, and realizing also the consequences of, of, of what would transpire once he gave himself up. And so his was a redemption that had nothing to do with religion, but everything to do with a process. And, and you know, it was difficult for me. I, I, I didn't know how I felt. I wasn't even sure I should shake his hand knowing that it had, you know, strangled somebody and then bludgeoned that person to death. But in fact, he was, you know, in one way, he was, in fact, a moral person. He had become a moral person. And so, you know, things are, I, I, my, my sense is that it is what we choose at any given time. So at a, at a certain point, he understood what he had done, and he chose to give himself up. And in that choice, he became a, a moral agent. It's amazing the path that some people will take, and it's good to hear that he's made the decisions that he has on, on his path, but I can understand your difficulty in, in, um, wanting, you know, just being in that situation. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And and it kind of brings me to my next question. We, I believe we have a couple minutes here. So (laughs) of course I've got many more, but we've only got time for one more is Mm -hmm. how has sexuality and morality changed by technology? Uh, well, it's changed profoundly and it has to do with the fact that we would are behaving in ways that we wouldn't necessarily uh, without the technology. Uh, and that, that was actually, uh, I was trying to understand whether technology had allowed us to behave a certain way that we had always wanted to, you know, in, in other words, mm-hmm. did it, does it allow women to explore their sexuality with a certain unabashed appetite and curiosity or, you know, has conventional morality held that in check and now, ter- you know, morality has released it. And, you know, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that, uh, it, you know, it's changed the sexual landscape. It's changed the way we date it's changed, uh, you know, uh, sexual uh, availability, um, and uh, you know, it, it's it's peculiar for somebody. For me, it's not right or wrong. It's just different. Well, do you know, Eden? Gosh, I wish we had more time. I really loved your book, Behaving Badly. I highly suggest oh. everyone go out and pick up their copy today. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's quite an endorsement. Well, thank you, Eden. It's been such a joy. That's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to tune in. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.